To the glory of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Seated before a majority of the people in the room today are babies waiting to be baptized and parents who are presenting them to the Lord. And while some people in the world may do this as a matter of ritual, tradition, and custom, for those of us deeply hearted in the faith of Jesus Christ, we know the importance of this. For these children are about to, in some symbolic and true way, die unto self and be born into the family of God. An initiation rite that brings us into God's family, no matter our age, when we're baptized. For the parents here together, they want the best for their children. Wisdom and grace and protection and care, which God offers mightily in the Good Shepherd readings we have today and offers week by week. For Jesus is indeed the Good Shepherd, the one who watches over the flock, and we are indeed the sheep, the ones who are watched over. And no, no more so than for the little young ones and for the vulnerable oldest among us, we need that care and that protection. Every parent here would want to be able to say that I want my children to hear me when I speak to them for their own good. I want my children to know me intimately and for me to know them in a parent-child relationship. And I want my children to follow me and go where I go and do what I say so they'll grow up right. Well, how much more so with the great King of the universe, our Lord, who says in the 27th verse of the 10th chapter of John's Gospel today, very simply and plainly, my sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. Three different things in one verse, but all the magnificent. That we as his sheep will hear his voice, that he will know us, and that we should follow him in with that. It's something I've banked my life on. Out of the entire gospel message today and the other readings, that verse just popped off the page at me when I read it. I do that often. I'll read a verse of scripture in the morning, and that verse will stay with me all day. I commend that to you. Just pick one little verse and carry it with you on an index card or on your cell phone somehow. All day long, go back to it. Sometime, I commend to you, you just pick one word. There are days when I'll just take one word, and it'll live with me the whole day. The word might be grace, or sacrifice, I should sacrifice. Selflessness, the word might be forgiveness, or love, or whatever it might be, but you can carry that. Today, this one verse, that we hear the voice of God, He knows us, and we are to follow Him. That's all we need. We get that straight in our lives, we become, we become dramatically transformed and changed into the likeness of Christ. The truth is we do hear God's voice. He tells us that over and over again. Anyone who has lived a faith life in the disciplines of the Lord learns that you can hear from Him. I don't ever hear an audible voice. I don't hear a voice in my head that says things. But I get clear and unmistakable direction, guidance, and care from God all along the way, as so many of you do, I'm sure, as well. Getting this guidance from God, hearing the voice of God, listening for Him, has been a major focus of my life. When I first became a Christian person for real, I was in my 30s, this became almost an obsession to me. I didn't understand it. How do you hear the voice of God? Who hears a voice? You hear voices, they put you away someplace. You're not supposed to hear voices. Like I said, I don't hear a voice, although I don't doubt many people do. I think God does speak to many people in different ways. The Bible is certainly full of it. But this has become a focus for me. It has become as vital to me as oxygen itself. I don't want to live my life without the Word of God, without the voice of God in my life. I just assume die right now and go to heaven as to live another day without Him speaking with me in my heart. Just like you wouldn't go another day without oxygen. It's vital. Many people don't believe that it happens, but I can tell you personally, I hear from God every day, several times a day, as so many of you do too. I'm not special in this. We all can hear from God in different ways in our life. And how do we do it? His voice can be heard through other trusted Christian people who are praying. People who are praying and know Him. You can hear wisdom from those who are kind of ahead of you in the faith. Or sometimes just out of the mouths of babes. How about that? Sometimes God just speaks to us that way. You can hear from God in circumstances, in impressions that you receive in your heart, and the clarity of thought that suddenly comes to you on something that seems infinitely complex, but to you it suddenly comes clear, crystal clear. And that happens to me a lot, and I know I'm not that smart, I'm not that able, but I've been given a gift of clarity and understanding in that. It happens that way. Most of all, the Word of God in Scripture 
that anything I have that I think I understand, I rub it up against scripture. I rub it up iron sharpening iron because they say that God will never give you an impression or give you direction in your life contrary to the scriptures. He gave us the scriptures of the Bible so we would know what truth is. God is truth. Jesus himself personally is truth. And those scriptures are the mind of God. So I know I can rely on those. And some common sensical things in the Bible tell me how to live. All those things come together though when we get to 1 Kings. And we hear that very famous boy, a verse that so many people know. That God will speak to you in a still small voice sometimes. A still small voice. And I hear that as well, that still, small voice. It happens that way. C.S. Lewis wrote this line, I commend it to you. He said, God will whisper to you in your pleasure. He will speak to you in your conscience. And he will shout to you in your pain. You get that? Whisper in pleasure, speak in your conscience, but shout to you in your pain. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world, says C.S. Lewis. God speaking to us. He speaks to us. Don't let people tell you, oh, that's hocus pocus. I'm too, there's too much of the hocus pocus around here. God speaks to his people. There was a virgin birth. He did die on a cross. He did physically get up and walk out of the tomb by the power of God. Jesus walked out of that tomb. And speaking to us is a chip shot in difficulty after all of that, I assure you. It's easy that he can speak to us. We must learn to tune into God's voice alone. There are many, many other voices, many other things that are coming to us from a lot of places. But we need to hear his voice alone, even above our own voices. We need to hear his voice alone above the din of life, the noise, the cacophony that goes on around us, moment by moment, all day long. An old story helps us here. 125 years ago or so, a young man went to a Western Union office to get a job, apply for a job as a telegrapher to send Morse code signals for telegraph over the telegraph wires. I gotta say that for young people who never heard of telegraph. Right. But didn't they just text? Why didn't you just text them? You know, this was like texting back in the old days, right? When he got there, there's like a dozen people in the waiting room applying for the same job. He sits down among them, and they're all waiting to be called to the inner room. And they're waiting, and they're waiting, when all of a sudden, the young man gets up, walks to the door that leads to the inner offices, goes through like he owns the place, and closes the door behind him. Of course, the other applicants are looking and saying, what's with this guy? Without any prompt or cue, he goes back there, he's going to be disqualified. He'll be done with this thing. Ten minutes later, out comes the big boss with the young man. And he says to the other applicants, you can all leave now, the position is his. And they begin to protest immediately like any of us would. How could he get the job? We were here before him. He goes in there, doesn't even get invited, we never even heard from him. Why did he get the job? The manager says this, as you were sitting in this office, you heard all the craziness of people coming and going. It's a busy place. Typewriters clacking. You know, everything, telephones ringing, lots of noise. And what you also may have heard in the background was the telegraph key tapping out its message. And the message said, if you can hear this, come into the office, the job is yours. <laughs> this young man had the ears to hear that through all the noise, through all the din, through all of it, and came in and got his reward. I tell you, that is a necessary analogy for our lives today. The noise is out there. The message, though, is still coming through loud and clear from God. And if you have the ears to hear that single telegraph key in the back of that office, over the typewriters, the phones, the people, the coming, the going, the shouting, the hustle, the bustle, you learn the secret of the Christian life, how to listen to God and walk forward in it. I, I talk about like Mother's Day today. Mothers want their children to have what's best. Well, I'm sort of a father in quotation marks of a parish. I care about you. I'm someone who comes as a pastor to help you to live a life in a way you don't know before. If you're not already tuned into how God speaks with you, stick with me for the rest of this sermon. I want to give you a great gift on how to go forward. Hearing God means tuning out the sounds of other things in the world. It could be the culture, the media, the internet, other people's voices, or even, God forbid, your own thinking, your own voice, supplanting God's wisdom with yours and thinking you have something there that will help you. It can't be done. It means you have to turn out and tune out the sounds of your own voice, which is often defective and self-interested thinking. You have to get rid of your defective and self-interested thinking. 
and be humble to receive what God has given you because you have nothing to do with it. It is His world. We're living in it. And He loves us and we're His children. And children should listen to their parents, which is what the people in the front row are telling their kids right now as, we, as I preach this sermon. Well with that. Now, God is so faithful to us that He waits for us even while we're not listening. And here's how He waits for us. Now, I've given you this phrase in a sermon before, and I want you to hear it again today. This is a really important phrase in my own life, and it should be in yours. God waits for us until we come to the end of ourselves. You hear that phrase? He waits for us until we come to the end of ourselves. I'm someone who grew up and I'm trying to be who I was. I thought I was becoming a big shot. All of us have concerns about who we are, what we did, who did us wrong. This is mine, that's yours. And we're filled with ourselves. And until we come to the end of ourselves, we don't have a hope of achieving this. I am crucified with Christ, therefore I no longer live. Jesus Christ lives in me. Forget yourself. The symbol of baptism for the babies, when baptism is done the way I would love to do it, with immersion under the water, submerging, you put the person under, and you bring them up gasping for the breath of new life. When it's done that way, the symbolism is we're putting you to death under the water. You get that? People wonder why they do that. You're, you're putting you to death under the water like you drowned or something. And then they bring you back up and you gasp for new breath, for new life, and now Christ is living in you, and it's not you living on your own anymore. You must come to the end of yourself. Oswald Chambers wrote this, on uh, my utmost for his highest. What hinders me most from hearing God, said Chambers, is that I am taken up with other things. It's not that I will not hear God, but I am not devoted in the right place to hear God. I am devoted to things, to service, to convictions, and in the meantime, God may be saying what he says, but I do not hear him because I'm thinking of other things. I'm filled with myself. I haven't come to the end of myself. You must listen for one thing, and that is God's voice. You take an old AM, FM radio, you turn the dial, and sometimes you get two radio stations at once. You're between the two stations on the dial. So you're hearing a little bit of each, and it's distortion. You can't hear that. By the same token, you can turn on two crystal clear radios um, right next to each other on a table, but they're set to two different stations, and it still doesn't make sense to you because there are two messages coming from the two radios. You've got to really figure it out. We need to stop doing that with our discussions with God. We need to have one voice, one projection. Just, all I hear is you, Lord. That's all I hear is you. The young man in the telegraph office only heard the telegraph key. He didn't hear all the noise around him, but that he got him the victory, got him the prize. Well, for you and me, the prize is found in Jesus Christ. For you and me, the prize is found in the life of fullness and richness which we get when we finally understand how to hear the voice of God and to live our lives as if it's true because it is. And Jesus told us today, he said, my sheep hear my voice, they follow me, and, they, and I know them, those three things. And he's not lying, he means that. Uh, Jacob Bohm was a 17th century Lutheran theologian. He wrote this, when you stand still, and when you stop thinking on your own, and when you stop willing things on your own, only then will eternal hearing, seeing, and speaking be revealed to you. Your own hearing, your own willing, and your own seeing, they hinder you. So much so that you do not see God, and you do not hear God. I can tell you from my own experience, to feel God in me, urging me and nudging me, giving me a clear mind, helping me to know what it is to do, is the most magnificent thing I can tell you. It is something unlike anything else to have that assurance that even if things go poorly from this point on, at least I know what he wants me to do and I'm going to do it. But most people never have that because they're preoccupied and they're dominated by their own voices or the voices of others. Now that's all about hearing God, right? But he said two other things. He said, I will know them. The part where he said I will know them, the part where he said they will follow me are also vitally important. For if I know you and you know me, you can understand me, you can hear me, and you can intuitively think of what I want you to know or want you to do. The perfect articulation of God is in the person of Jesus Christ. Watching Jesus and the way he lived and reading about him in the Bible gives me the mind of God. But also I need to know it in other ways. Intimacy increases communications. A husband and wife, my wife Patty and I, sometimes we don't even speak. And she pulls out the butter and I hand her a knife. Sometimes we do it. You know what the other one wants. You just know it intuitively. Fred and Ginger, anybody remember Fred and Ginger Rogers? They're dancing around, doing their thing. 
they knew where the other one was going to move. George Burns and Gracie Allen, one would start a joke, the other would finish it, and it was seamless, and this went on. We have Batman and Robin understanding each other. Stephen Curry and Clay Thompson on the Golden State Warriors, passing and taking shots, just knowing where the other one is without even looking, making a blind pass. I know where he's going to be because I play with him every day. Intimacy increases communications. Jesus says he knows us, and he wants us to know how to live the life like that. Dallas Willard wrote this wrote a book, and in the book he talked about this feature. And he's talked about how we can hear God and how not to hear God. Listen to this sentence so you'll know a little bit of the angle on it. Spiritual people are not those who engage in certain spiritual or religious practices. That's not who they are. They are those people who draw their life from a conversational relationship with God. Right? It's not about doing things in religious practices. Those are important, don't get me wrong. But that's not the essence of it. The essence of it is having a spiritual conversation with God, praying and listening and being with Him so that people will understand what it is He'd have in their hearts. I think about how some people in our parish teach English as a second language, ESL. I thought, wouldn't it be cool if we taught prayer as a second language? Prayer is the thing we should have. But then I said, you know, if we did that into a prayer as a second language, it would actually be terrible because I just revealed the deficiency of the analogy there. It shouldn't be prayer as a second language. Prayer should be our first language. And our English or our Spanish or whatever else it is we speak, that should be our second language. We are born in the image of God. We're made to breathe holy things. We're made to live eternally. We're made to know the mind of God because he gives us the revelation of himself in Jesus Christ. And he adores us and cares for us and watches over us. And these things become so important. Finally, Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice. We got that part. I know them. I just talked about knowing them. But here's the key. They will follow me. And this is vitally important, the part about following. God makes clear every day he's going to speak to us. So expect to hear from him. You should expect to hear from God every day, several times a day. Like I always say, if you hear God a hundred times a day, you're missing it by a thousand, and he's speaking to you moment by moment everything you do. But if you do not expect to hear from him, of course you're not going to hear from him. It's not going to happen. You need to expect it, and to know that he's trying to break through with a message. And if you truly want to hear from him, and you truly want the fullness of this, here's the hook. You must be ready to act on whatever you tell him. Be ready to act when you hear the message. Like if somebody came up to me and said, oh, Ed, hurry, there's a child dangling from a window on the second floor. I could say, oh my goodness, that's terrible. Or I could race as fast as my old legs will carry me to that child to save the child. When you get a message that's important, you act on it. You just don't receive it as information. It's not information, it's transformation. We change into new beings like Christ, and we must do those things. So we expect to hear from him, and we act on it. Martin Luther, the great Martin Luther, said this back in the 16th century. A lot of old century guys, but they got the story straight. Martin Luther said, you may as well quit reading the Bible. You may as well quit hearing the word of God. And just go ahead and give in to the devil and get it over with. If you do not desire to live according to what it tells you. It's not an intellectual game. It's transformation of the heart of the being, it's surrendering of self, it's dying unto self, it's getting to the end of yourself, as I said earlier, that leaps us into this. Do you not see it? When we put God's guidance and God's holy scriptures into practice in our lives, we begin to explode in power, in grace, in fulfillment, and ability, because he meant for it to be that way. That's when we live the truth of the God who made us. It is when one begins to earnestly follow him as leader that that spiritual switch is thrown. I follow him, now my switch is being thrown. The, the old test that I, I told you about, um, how do you know if you're a leader? Anybody know that? I've said this before. How do you know if you're a leader? Turn around and see if anybody's following you. If nobody's following you, you're not a leader. But if you say, oh, I'm a leader, I'm a leader. Nobody's following this person, I'm not a leader. By the same token, flip it on its head. How do you know if you're a follower? Look in front of you. Who are you doing? Who are you watching after? Who are you listening to? Most people have nobody in front of them. They're their own leader, right? Captain of my fate, the master of my soul kind of thing. I may have put that backwards. But if you see somebody in front of you and it's not Christ himself, you're going down a deadly path. This is going to end up in ruin. You want to follow him 
and Him alone, and when you do that, you'll be fine. You are wrong if you think you can relate to God by your intelligence alone. Did you hear me? You are wrong if you think you can relate to God by your intelligence. Your intelligence is puny and insignificant. You can't relate to God by your intelligence. You can't. You're wrong if you think that God's truth can be distilled from the Bible by your own efforts. You can find out truth by your own efforts. I can do this. I don't need any help. I got it. You're wrong if you do that. You are wrong if you conclude that the voice of God can be heard by legalistic religious practices. It doesn't come from that. But you are right. You are absolutely correct if you believe that you can hear from God when you throw your heart wide open, receive his Holy Spirit, come to the end of yourself and say, Lord, make me like your son Jesus and give me what I need to know for guidance and direction in your life, and then it happens. Now, I, I once read that a good sermon is one where um, people don't just leave impressed. That's not important. People leave, I'm impressed by that sermon. That's not a good sermon. A good sermon is one where somebody leaves saying, I'm going to do something. I'm going to do something, but better yet, I'm going to invite God to come into my life and do something to change me and make me more like him. That's a good sermon. The pure-hearted person will evermore double down to hear the voice of God, to know him, and to follow him. Simple formula. Take that home and your life will be changed forever. Amen.